wait for a bit for uh, first viewers to come in on TikTok. And then I wanted to discuss um, the matter of Ernst Jünger, his book War as an Inner Experience. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I think the way things are going in the Western world, I imagine that um, the United States is headed for its own sort of French Revolution. But I think the French Revolution is not what we think it was. If you look, there's something I didn't know about France, is that um, France actually has most castles ever built in Europe. Uh, way more than Germany, way more than Italy. France, I think, has more than half of all the castles ever built anywhere in Europe, which suggests that from, say, the year 1200 AD to 1800 AD or so, when these castles were largely built, uh, France was able to extract most wealth and resources from the rest of Europe. And then, of course, during the colonial age, France also extracts even more wealth. It seems to be that France benefited tremendously from the wealth. England, for example, hardly has any castles. Scotland has more castles than England. Ireland has more castles than England. Um, and although it's, it is true that the British, the English people, were able to send a lot more people to the colonies, to the United States, to Canada, to New Zealand and Australia and South Africa and so on. Um, that's because the French population, someone told me, peaked just before this colonial age where you could start sending people out. Uh, and so the British were able, although the British had fewer people, they were, uh, I mean, sorry, although the British had fewer wealth, less wealth, they had more people that they could send out and away. And that is why the British were able to conquer a lot more colonial territory than the French. The French have Quebec and the French have some territories elsewhere, uh, Algeria, whatever. Uh, the point is that uh, white French people never really became uh, a majority anywhere, but the English speaking whites did. Uh, and so what I want to talk about is, is that uh, the French eventually got their French Revolution. But wait a minute, what was it really about? We say it was about the attack on Christianity and, and religion, but that is really an attack on, uh, on your people's well-being, their rep reproductive capacity, and so on and so forth. And so what these French elites, who were the wealthiest of all European elites, did was, I think, they funded the French Revolution. And although the king was slaughtered and so on, and some noble people were butchered, it was large unit, largely an attack on the common people. So this is how I see it nowadays. The French elites funded the French Revolution, which was largely an attack on religion, which in itself is an attack on uh, the family life and the spiritual well-being of the people living in Europe, uh, in France. Uh, and so diminishing the people's ability to get organized and fight back against the truly exploitative elites who had been exploiting them for hundreds of years. You have to keep in mind that in Europe, the European peoples used to be serfs, which is a lot like slavery, but without chains. It does mean you are appointed a sort of plot where you have to live. Um, you, you are you are not allowed to own private property. So there was a whole proper. This is a, a strange distinction that we don't often think about nowadays. But in those days, uh, the poor were not allowed to own private property, didn't own land, didn't own their own houses, and so on and so forth. Um, so there was a distinction between the property class, the rich, and those who did not have property. Uh, and I think that the same thing is going to happen to, uh, to the United States. So the United States has... Uh, uh, this, a similar kind of development nowadays. I feel that the United States elites, the American elites, are already slowly doing the exact same things that the elites of France did leading up to the French Revolution. Why do I say that? Well, in the United States, you have the attack, the LGBT. In the United States, you have um, uh, uh, the attack on family. You have attacks on pregnancy centers, like the opposite of an abortion center is a pregnancy center where you help women with their pregnancies. These are under attack in the United States. There have been like bombings at night and so on. Um, there's been uh, uh, the attack on sex and gender, basically 
sex has been abolished. You can't, right? There's no more men and women in the United States legally. There's only your imagined feelings. And all these things are attacks on the reproductive capacity of the people living in the United States, which is exactly what I think the French Revolution was about. It was about attacking the people, uh, deconstructing them, uh, forcing them into atomized individualist units so that they could not unite against the exploitative elites. Um, this is also what Black Lives Matter was about, because at some point during the, um, what was it, the Wall Street, uh, you know, just Occupy Wall Street movements? Yeah, that's when the American people actually came together and they started plotting against their elites. And that is when all of a sudden New York Times and, uh, and Washington Post and all these mainstream media start uh, talking about racism and Black Lives Matter and so on to divide the people again, to give people something else to worry about. Um, uh, and so that's what it's about. Our ruling classes in the Western world are our enemies. They are simply pure evil. Um, they're not on our side. There's a video uh, of Liz Truss saying exactly that. She doesn't really care about the genetic makeup or the ethnic makeup of the people living in the British Isles, uh, in, in, you know, in England and Scotland and so on. Uh, here's some more quotes. The former French president, Sarkozy, who was Jewish, said racial interbreeding is not a choice, but it should be an obligation. He saw it as the, the duty of the 21st century to basically mix the Europeans with uh, Arabs and Africans. This is basically the Kalergi plan by Richard von Kahlen over Kalergi. You know, it's, it beats me why these people think this way. I still don't even know why they think this is a good idea. First of all, it's not going to happen. And secondly, it's an extremely poor idea. You know, a former Swedish prime minister also said that only barbarism is genuinely Swedish. You know, uh, a former um, German chancellor said that the, dem the demographic change is a good thing. She also, uh, Angela Merkel also built welcomed refugees, remember, famously. Uh, a former UK prime minister uh, said that they don't care about the demographic decline of British people. Uh, and the current U.S. president, Joe Biden, has once said on camera that white Americans will become a minority and that's our strength. Like, why do they think like that? Why do they think this way? It makes no sense whatsoever. You know, uh, it's very odd and very strange, especially since, um, you know, you can have all sorts of colonial arguments. But of course, the Europeans in Europe never left Europe. And most Europeans were most European nations, the majority of European nations were never even involved in colonialism and slavery anyway. Eastern Europe, for example. And I think the narratives that are spun around all of this all point toward one thing. There is a, a sort of global envy for the fact that some people are born with a pale skin that everybody else wishes they had. They wishes they had our looks, apparently. Right. Because how many how many black women do you know who, who bleach their hair and skin to, to look whiter? You know, how many women from India are bleaching their skin to look whiter? You'd be surprised. It's 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 basically insane. Like they hate us, but at the same time, they want to be us. They hate us because they ain't us. Right. And that puts us into a position of uh, a point of no return. There is no way we can reason with people who hate us so intensely and so deeply in such such vitriolic ways. There is absolutely nothing that we could possibly do about this. You cannot reason with a volcano. And that's an ex that's something that uh, German author Ernst Jünger once said. You can't argue with a volcano. Hold on. I wanted to get into this book by uh, Ernst Jünger, uh, War as an Inner Experience. I'm going to read some uh, quotes from this book and uh, give my thoughts around it. Uh, it's the same author of the other book that I also uh, discussed a while back, the, the Forest Passage by Ernst Jünger. I think these two books, The Forest Passage and uh, War as an Inner Experience, are the, the two main books I would recommend anybody, any right-wing European man who wants to, who, who has the sort of motivational willingness to go out there and go and do something. If you want to go and do something and, 
and get something done. You know, these two books, War as an Inner Experience and the other one, uh, The Forest Passage. Uh, this one is a manual uh, for rebels who, who are willing to go at it like, say, uh, a Che Guevara, but then a Che Guevara on the right. Right? And you're going to fight the whole system. Uh, war as an inner experience is for those who are uh, uh, looking to unleash their uh, most aggressive potential and find justifications for it. And I think there's a reason why I would promote these books. Um, you know, it's important that we... Uh, uh, start infecting our people in Europe with these beliefs, with these ideas. It's great that we have this book culture, that we have these kinds of books that have been written for us so that we can uh, read them again, but then also spread the word and start, start rallying people, start motivating people to uh, get on board with this. Because this is the, like I said, it's a point of no return. We've We've, we've, we've gone down this tunnel or sort of funnel. It gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And there's no way back because behind us, there are other people storming in, you know, like a fish uh, trapped, like a fish trap. And I think we can do this. So let me just get to the, to the main point of this video. Uh, I want to read, you, read to you some, uh, some quotes from this book. Um, and I'll give you my thoughts around it. Because I found the, the book, of course, was written in German. Uh, you can find the German version PDF file for free somewhere on the Internet, on Libgen, for example. Or you can probably order the English language version, the translation from somewhere as well. So here are some English language uh, quotes. So, and we cannot deny as much as some would like to, that war, father of all things, is also in us. War has hammered, chiseled, and hardened us to what we are today. So this book by Jünger is also uh, a total justification of warfare, though for me there would be one caveat, is that we pick the right enemy. It's, just, it's not just war for war's sake, it's war for war's sake but for the right causes, for the causes that we care about ourselves. And this excludes, say, billionaire interests. It excludes state interests. I'm not going to fight for the states of Europe. I'm not going to fight for the rich of Europe. I'm going to fight for what is best for the survival of our people, right? And always, as long as the spinning wheel of life continues to whirl within us, this war will be its axis. War has educated us to fight, and we will remain fighters as long as we live. I think somewhere in the book, Jünger also discusses this distinction between the professional army, the standing army, say in the US military is a standing army, where people decide what is right or wrong, or whether or not you perhaps prefer uh, a stronger race, a race of warriors who enjoy war for war's sake. And he says that is actually the stronger, uh, the stronger position to have. Uh, a standing army is like an academia. It's like academia. It's all about calculating your moves. Whereas, um, if you are fighting for your survival, you are going to have to fight basically based on, uh, based on the intense, strong feelings and emotions that you, as a man, have on the inside. Your, your masculine turbulence, as I would call it. And so it comes down to the question, you know, sure, uh, this is also in the book, uh, we know that God is on the side of the strongest battalions, but are the strongest battalions also on the side of the highest culture? To which Ernst Jünger answers, well, that is the reason why the highest culture has a moral obligation to also have the strongest battalions. So it's unapologetically uh, pro-war, uh, masculinity, so to speak, right? Yeah, someone asked me about my old uh, reading list. It is on my YouTube and on my Substack somewhere. It's on my YouTube. Uh, I did a video about it. I posted that one to YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is at uh, the great Johannes. So I'm just reading uh, 
in case you're joining now the live show, I'm just reading lots of quotes from this book. Uh, so if you're interested in that, then I uh, keep listening. Mm. It is true that he seems to be dead, his battlefield abandoned and disreputable like torture chambers and mounted gallows. But the warrior spirit has moved into his front servants and he never leaves their side. Right. So some men are gripped by war uh, and they form basically, well, the most important defense of a society, I would say. So I found these quotes on some tic uh, Twitter channel. So I'm, uh, it's called at Frontier Vitalism. Vitalism. Oh, as a, without the I. Right? Do you not hear him roaring in a thousand cities? Do you not hear his thunderstorms all around us, as in the days when the battle surrounded us? Do you not see his flame glowing in the eyes of each one of us? Sometimes he sleeps, but when the earth trembles, he bursts forth. Here, he is probably a personification of war or the battle gods, right? Just as the primeval forest strives ever more toweringly and mightily to the heights sucking its growth forces from its own decline, so each new human generation grows on soil made stratified by the decomposition of countless generations that rest here from the circle of life. Yeah, this is the same concept of the circle of life that you see in the movie The Lion King, right? It's that the land we live on has been fertilized by the warriors of past generations. They fertilized this land with their blood. There's probably no inch of European soil that has not been fertilized by the blood of our ancestors. Um, here you see how different this book is from modern thinking. The modern academia, the modern, modern leftists, they are so afraid and so scared of conflict. They think that they need to avoid conflict in order to create um, world peace. But here Ernst Jünger says, no, 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 it's the, exactly, it's the exact opposite. Only those most ruthless, brutal people who are willing to fight for the fight's sake are the ones who survive and fertilize the land for the next generations. It's us or them. So you can, you can decide for yourself if you want to have world peace or if perhaps you are ready uh, to face reality, is what I would say. Men are still creating a tower of immeasurable height for which the lineages are layered, one state of their being on top of the other, with blood, agony, and longing. Uh, the tower is a reference to the Tower of Babel, or in the sense we are building a tower toward God. Uh, and this is the real progress, but this progress is achieved through warfare. Where all thought and all action are reduced to a formula, feelings must also melt back and adapt themselves to the terrible simplicity of the goal, the annihilation of the enemy. See, again, totally unapologetic, not afraid to, uh, absolutely not afraid to justify that this is uh, a battle of the strongest and the smartest and so on, and the most ruthless. And I think in a sense, our ruling elites everywhere in the world, and especially in the West, are very much aware of this. I think they know very well that uh, they are themselves in a, in a struggle with their own people. And if their people are no longer profitable or if their people are getting too old, they will purge us as though we are cattle. They really look down on us as though we are animals. And if we, <clears throat> if we are aware of this, if we accept this, we may make a very smart decision. You may, for example, decide to attack your ruling classes, in which case they will have the money to pay people to fight you back. Or we might simply walk out. And I think a walk out movement, <clears throat> which will also require force and violence to achieve it, but a walk out movement where we simply walk out, walk away from our elites, then what the hell are they going to do? We should find a way to make it expensive and unaffordable to, the, to our own elites to attack us any longer. We need to make the attacks that they uh, lodge against us so expensive that they won't be able to afford it. I think that is the, uh, the end goal.
For all technology is mere machine, it is chance, a blind bullet, devoid of any will of its own, while what animates man is the will to kill through a storm of gunpowder, iron and steel. Wow, that's very powerful, right? And when two men clash in the whirlwind of battle, two beings meet, of which only one can survive. For these two beings have placed themselves in a primordial relationship, the struggle for existence, its most naked form. In this struggle, the weaker must remain on the ground, while the victor, with the weapon clutched in his fist, steps over the slain deeper into battle, deeper into life. Here, yeah, war is life. Uh, somewhere in the book, he also writes, uh, Leben heißt töten, or to live means to kill. Somewhere in the craters of no man's land, a whispering troop, armed to the teeth and ready to leap, could be waiting to launch itself toward the trench for a sudden slaughter, for a brief orgy in fire and blood. Yeah. The refinement of the spirit, the tender cult of the mind, perished in the clashing rebirth of barbarism. Other gods were raised to the throne of the day, strength, fist, and manly courage. Uh, Jünger would agree. Jünger would say that um, courage begins when you um, have overcome the fear of death. The spirit of material war, of trench warfare, a spirit that, that became more and more ruthless, savage and brutal, and forged men like the world had never seen. It was a whole new race, embodied energy and changed, charged with supreme force. War is no more a human institution than the sexual instinct. It is a law of nature, therefore we shall never escape its spell. We must not deny it, otherwise we will be devoured by it. A culture may seem to be towering, but if the masculine spirit burns out, then it becomes a colossus on feet of clay, so that it will collapse. So the mightier its structure, the more terrible its fall. If we consider a culture or its living carrier, the people, as a constantly growing sphere, then the will, the, un the unconditional and ruthless will to preserve and increase that is, the will to fight, is the magnetic center by which its structure is strengthened and always new parts are attracted. If this center loses its power, it will trickle away into atoms. It was the manhood awakening in us, the flag, the galloping steed, the blade thrusting from the scabbard. It was the nightly ride before dew and day and the red blood that shot from burning wounds. That was battle. We felt ourselves to be heirs and bearers of thoughts that had been inherited through centuries from generation to generation and carried closer to fulfillment. Above all thought and action, there was a heaviest duty, a highest honor and a shining goal, death for the homeland and its greatness. Yeah, this is what we're missing in the Western world here. You know? Action in itself is nothing. Conviction is everything. Yep. That is what I wanted to talk about. So I'm done. Uh, I'm done reading the quotes now. Uh, let me remove this. Uh... Yeah, hard pill. <laughs> yeah, action in itself is nothing and conviction is everything. And I think that is really important that um, a human being, what motivates you to do anything at all? It's it's what's in here, right? It's in your mind, in your um, uh, in your soul, in your body, in your spirit. You know? Yeah, here's an uneducated person asks if the West has minerals. Yes, Germany still has a ton of coal, enough to start another war. So, we also, of course, we have minerals. You know, I sometimes can't really believe how how ignorant how you know, how weird these people are, you know. It's, it's frustrating to talk to them because they come across as though they're like uneducated children, you know. I'm experimenting with the uh, the comment box in my video so that when I post it to YouTube, people can see what I'm responding to. Um. 
And one of my favorite you, uh, TikTokers is, I think she's gone now, Daria. I used to follow her. I think she's really gone now. This time she deleted her account, you know. Right, the terrible wars of the elite made us disgusted by war, yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean, yeah. You, we've been fighting for interest, uh, yeah, for the financial interests of billionaire elites and so on, of these power of like state elites, the people who ru own the state or the, who run the government. Because the government is like a mafia and these people who run this mafia uh, in, the, you know, in their own benefit, they send us to war as though we are, as though soldiers are just cattle, as though we're animals. They send us to war to fight for their interests. And, and it works because people listen to the radio and to TV and they read the newspapers and they think this is what they're supposed to do. They're just so brainwashed. I find it really, uh, this is what I'm trying to break through with all my speaking. I'm trying to break through that brainwashing, you know? Yeah. Now we want world peace, but they send us to war against Russia and then Iran and China. And they say they say they want world peace, but then of course what they really mean is they want our extinction. They want us gone. World peace for them, but not for us, right? Yeah. They let us hate wars, yeah. If if we could somehow, you know. And this is why I often talk about the spiritual side of things, about the religion and so on, is if we could somehow get the people to feel that they do belong together, that we are one people, you know, and that we have a reason, a right to exist, and that we have the right to do whatever it takes to, you know, secure our survival, secure our existence, right? Oh, you also saw her. You saw Daria? Yeah. I wanted to watch the live stream, but I missed it. And now she's gone, yeah. Oh, you watched it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she spoke about uh, her childhood a lot. Yeah. Um, she started speaking. She told me she started speaking on TikTok also because she was uh, was never allowed to speak. And now she wanted to know, you know, what people really think of her, of her thoughts and the uh, I think she's, she's like a very intelligent woman, but I hope she, uh, I hope she's fine now. All right. I've been speaking for 30 minutes. Usually I try to fill an hour. I always say that, but <laughs> I'm just thinking of, um, sometimes you just have to pause for a moment and then new thoughts will, you know, arrive in your mind. And that's the whole point of what I wanted to talk about is that, uh, people are motivated by spirits inside of them. And if you allow themselves, if you allow those spirits to to well up in you, you will feel a lot more confident and a lot more motivated to do all sorts of things in your life. It can truly transform you if you simply stop following the rules in the real world and you start listening to those intense uh, spiritual sensations inside of you and allow yourself to follow those that would tr truly transform your world. You will be very different. You will respond very differently. You will not be uh, uh, ashamed of uh, doing things wrong or something, right? Right, no uh, no rational thinking, right? But more of a, uh, more in the sense of uh, uh, being aware of what you actually really feel. And this, of course, is true for women and for men too. I mean, it's not about crying, it's about feeling your strengths and feeling what motivates you, what really motivates you and not just your job uh, to make money, right? Yeah, right. Not mindlessness. Exactly. Uh, you're living life on autopilot in that case. Yeah, you're just uh, you're not really aware of uh, what motivates you or what you even care about. It's like if, if you if you are a people pleaser, you always try to be nice to everybody, always make everybody happy, then you don't know what you want, because if you if you want something for yourself, other people might not like you anymore, right? They're a little, you know. All right. 
normally I have like 30 or 40 uh, viewers live, but now it's a bit less. I don't know why. Maybe it's the time of the day or something. Thursday. I don't know. Don't know why it's different now. I have learned. Maybe I'll just talk about other things. I have learned some things about you know dealing with the commenters on tiktok some people are just professional trolls and they really make an effort in uh, they, they put a lot of effort into playing mind games with you and so i start to recognize their tricks how they do it and it's really simple you know um uh, they always ask some questions and very, they're very pushy you know even though it's in writing right text is in writing but then you you notice that it's very pushy writing they really try to push you to agree to something like First, you, they want you to. They, have, they ask you a small question. Do you agree to this? And they ask you another question. Do you agree to that? Oh, so you agree to this? Like they they want to push you in that direction. But of course, uh, if you are aware of these kinds of games, they are very easy to spot. And the the people are always come off as very aggressive and very unpleasant. So you know, you know, wait, there's something wrong with these people. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna continue interaction with them. You just, you just block them or something. Is that as they always used to say, like don't feed the trolls, right? Well, you shouldn't. Don't uh, don't interact with the trolls. I think some of them just get paid or something. Like they get paid to try to make people, outspoken people, feel uh, bad about themselves or something. So they hope that you'll quit speaking. Maybe that's what happened to Daria or something. Because I can imagine that if you get a lot of the negativity in the comments, you are going to want to stop. Yeah. You know? Uh, and that's also a problem for all the social media, of course, right? If you, uh, a lot of people don't produce content, they only watch content, of course, which is not a problem. But then the, the, the content creators who put in the effort to make content, if you are constantly attacking them, then, you know, they might just quit and then what? Then that's why I think that's what happened to Facebook, right? Who posts, who really posts interesting things on Facebook anymore? No one does that. Twitter X is still alive and TikTok still alive. Yeah. But you notice that people get tired of something. They just stop using it. Right. Uh, <clears throat> do you think monarchy, uh, like in the middle ages would be possible after these governments collapse? Um, well, that would be a feudal system where you have nobility, royalty, and the people. And so usually the nobility would side with the people against the nobility. Now it's different. Now we have the nobility siding with the poor against both the middle class and the, and the royalty, to say it that way. Anyway, I think uh, what might happen is something very different, is that for a very long time, people are just going to be absolutely tired of things like governments and elites. We just don't want this crap anymore. All right, I'm going to take a break. I'll... Uh, I'll do another live show soon, uh, maybe uh, on the weekend or uh, Monday or Tuesday or so.